Child Raising on Mars. After a breakfast, which was an exact replica of the meal of the preceding day, and an index of practically every meal which followed while I was with the green men of Mars, Sola escorted me to the plaza, where I found the entire community engaged in watching or helping at the harnessing of huge Mastodonian animals to great three-wheeled chariots. There are about 250 of these vehicles, each drawn by a single animal, any one of which, from their appearance, might easily have drawn the entire wagon train when fully loaded. The chariots themselves were large, commodious, and gorgeously decorated. In each was seated a female Martian, loaded with ornaments of metal, with jewels and silks and furs, and upon the back of each of the beasts which drew the chariots was perched a young Martian driver. Like the animals upon which the warriors were mounted, the heavier draft animals wore neither bit nor bridle, but were guided entirely by telepathic means. This power is wonderfully developed in all Martians and accounts largely for the simplicity of their language and the relatively few words spoken, exchanged even in long conversations. It is the universal language of Mars, through the medium of which the higher and lower animals of this world of paradoxes are able to communicate to a greater or less extent depending upon the intellectual sphere of the species and the development of the individual. As the cavalcade took up the line of march in single file, Sola dragged me into an empty chariot and we proceeded with the procession toward the point by which I had entered the city the day before. At the head of the caravan rode some 200 warriors, five abreast, and a like number brought up the rear, while 25 or 30 outriders flanked us on either side. Everyone but myself, men, women, and children, were heavily armed, and at the tail of each chariot trotted a Martian hound, my own beast following closely behind ours. In fact, the faithful creature never left me voluntarily during the entire 10 years I spent on Mars. Our way led out across the little valley before the city, through the hills, and down into the Dead Sea bottom, which I had traversed on my journey from the incubator to the plaza. The incubator, as it proved, was the terminal point of our journey this day, and as the entire cavalcade broke into a mad gallop as soon as we reached the level expanse of sea bottom, we were soon within sight of our goal. Reaching it, the chariots were parked with military precision on the four sides of the enclosure, and a half a score of warriors headed by the enormous chieftain, and including Tars Tarkas and several other lesser chiefs, dismounted and advanced towards it. I could see Tars Tarkas explaining something to the principal chieftain, whose name, by the way, was as nearly as I can translate it into English, Lorquas Putmel, Jed, Jed being his title. I was soon appraised of the subject of their conversation as calling to Sola, Tars Tarkas signed for her to send me to him. I had by this time mastered the intricacies of walking under Martian conditions and quickly responding to his command, I advanced to the side of the incubator where the warrior stood. As I reached their side, a glance showed me that all but a very few eggs had hatched, the incubator being fairly alive with the hideous little devils. They ranged in height from three to four feet and were moving restlessly about the enclosure as though searching for food. As I came to a halt before him, Tars Tarkas pointed over the incubator and said, Sak. I saw that he wanted me to repeat my performance of yesterday for the edification of Lorquas Potmel. 
and as I must confess, my prowess gave me no little satisfaction. I responded quickly, leaping entirely over the parked chariots on the far side of the incubator. As I returned, Lord Quaspotmel grunted something at me, and turning to his warriors gave a few words of command relative to the incubator. He paid no further attention to me, and I was thus permitted to remain close and watch their operations, which consisted in breaking an opening in the wall of the incubator large enough to permit of the exit of the young Martians. On either side of this opening, the women and the younger Martians, both male and female, formed two solid walls leading out through the chariots and quite away into the plain beyond. Between these walls, the little Martians scampered, wild as deer, being permitted to run the full length of the aisle where they were captured one at a time by the women and older children. The last in the line, capturing the first little one to reach the end of the gauntlet, her op opposition in the line, capturing the second, and so on, until all the little fellows had left the enclosure and been appropriated by some youth or female. As the women caught the young and they fell out of line and returned to their respective chariots, while those who fell into the hands of the young men were later turned over to some of the women. I saw that the ceremony, if it could be dignified by such a name, was over. In seeking out Sola, I found her in our chariot with a hideous little creature held tightly in her arms. The work of rearing young, green Martians, consists solely in teaching them to talk and to use the weapons of warfare with which they are loaded down from the very first year of their lives coming from eggs, in which they have lain for five years, the period of incubation. They step forth into the world perfectly developed except in size, entirely unknown to their mothers, who in turn would have difficulty in pointing out the fathers with any degree of accuracy. They are the common children of the community, and their education devolves upon the females who chance to capture them as they leave the incubator. Their foster mothers may not even have had an egg in the incubator, as was the case with Sola, who had not commenced to lay, until less than a year before she became the mother of another woman's offspring. But this counts for, a, for little among the green Martians, as parental and filial love is as unknown to them as it is common among us. I believe this horrible system has been carried on for ages is the direct cause of the loss of all the finer feelings and higher humanitarian instincts among these poor creatures. From birth they know no father or mother love. They know not the meaning of the word home. They are taught that they are only suffered to live until they can demonstrate by their physique and ferocity that they are fit to live. Should they prove deformed or defective in any way, they are promptly shot. Nor do they see a tear shed for a single one of the many cruel hardships they pass through from earliest infancy. I do not mean that the adult Martians are unnecessarily or intentionally cruel to the young, but theirs is a hard and pitiless struggle for existence upon a dying planet the natural resources of which have dwindled to a point where the support of each additional life means an added tax upon the community into which it is thrown. By careful selection, they rear only the hardiest specimens of each species, and with almost supernatural foresight, they regulate the birth rate to merely offset the loss by death. Each adult Martian female brings forth about 13 eggs each year, and those which meet the size, weight, and specific gravity tests are hidden in the recesses of some subterranean vault where the temperature is too low for incubation. Every year these eggs are carefully examined by a council of 20 chieftains, and all but 100 of the most perfect are destroyed out of each yearly supply. At the end of five years, about 500 almost perfect eggs have been chosen from the thousands brought forth. 
These are then placed in the almost airtight incubators to be hatched by the sun's rays over a period of another five years. The hatchling, which we had witnessed today, was a fairly representative event of its kind, all but about 1% of the eggs hatching in two days. If the remaining eggs ever hatched, we knew nothing of the fate of the little Martians. They were not wanted, as their offspring might inherit and trans transmit the tendency to prolonged incubation, and thus upset the system which has maintained for ages and which permits the adult Martians to figure the proper time for return to the incubators, almost to an hour. The incubators are built in remote fastness, where there is little or no likelihood of their being discovered by other tribes. The result of such a catastrophe would be no children in the community for another five years. I was later to witness the results of the discovery of an alien incubator. The community of which the Green Martians with whom my lot was cast formed a part was composed of some 30,000 souls. They roamed an enormous tract of arid and semi-arid land between 40 and 80 degrees south latitude and bounded on the east and west by two large fertile tracts. Their headquarters lay in the southeast corner of this district, near the crossing of two of the so-called Martian canals. As the incubator had been placed far north of their own territory in a supposedly uninhabited and unfrequented area, we had before us a tremendous journey concerning which I, of course, knew nothing. After our return to the dead city, I passed several days in comparative idleness. On the day following our return, all the warriors had ridden forth early in the morning and had not returned until just before darkness fell. As I later learned, they had been to subterranean vaults in which the eggs were kept and had transported them to the incubator, which they had then walled up for another five years and which in all probability would not be visited again during that period. The vaults which hid the eggs until they were ready for the incubator were located many miles south of the incubator and would be visited yearly by the council of 20 chieftains. Why they did not arrange to build their vaults and incubators nearer home has always been a mystery to me. <clears throat> and like many other Martian mysteries, unsolved and unsolvable by earthly reasoning and customs, Sola's duties were now doubled as she was compelled to care for the young Martian as well as for me, but neither one of us required much attention. And as we were both about equally advanced in Martian education, Sola took it upon herself to train us together. Her prize consisted in a male, about four feet tall, very strong and physically perfect. Also, he learned quickly, and we had considerable amusement, at least I did, over the keen rivalry we displayed. The Martian language, as I have said, is extremely simple, and in a week I could make all of my wants known and understand nearly everything that was said to me. Likewise, under Sola's tutelage, I developed my telepathic powers so that I shortly could sense practically everything that went on around me. What surprised Sola most in me was that while I could catch telepathic messages easily from others, and often when they were not intended for me, no one could read a jot from my mind under any circumstances. At first this vexed me, but later I was very glad of it as it gave me an undoubted advantage over the Martians. A Fair Captive from the Sky The third day after the incubator ceremony, we set forth toward home, but scarcely had the head of the procession debouched into the open ground before the city than orders were given for an immediate and hasty return. As though trained for years in this particular evolution, the green Martians melted like mist into the spacious doorways of the nearby buildings. 
until, in less than three minutes, the entire cavalcade of chariots, mastodons, and mounted warriors was nowhere to be seen. Sola and I had entered a building upon the front of the city, in fact, the same one which I had had my encounter with the apes, and wishing to see what had caused the sudden retreat, I mounted to an upper floor and peered from the window out over the valley and the hills beyond. And there I saw the cause of their sudden scurrying to cover. A huge craft, long, low, and gray painted, swung slowly over the crest of the nearest hill. Following it came another, and another, and another, until twenty of them, swinging low above the ground, sailed slowly and majestically toward us. Each carried a strange banner, swung from stem to stern above the upper works, and upon the prow of each was painted some odd device that gleamed in the sunlight and showed plainly, even at the distance at which we were from the vessels. I could see figures crowding the forward decks and upper works of the aircraft. Whether they had discovered us or simply were looking at the deserted city, I could not say, but in any event, they received a rude reception, for suddenly and without warning the green Martian warriors fired a terrific volley from the windows of the buildings facing the little valley across which the great ships were so peacefully advancing. Instantly the scene changed as by magic. The foremost vessel swung broadside toward us and bringing her guns into play returned our fire. At the same time, moving parallel to our front for a short distance and then turning back with the evident intention of completing a great circle which would bring her up to position once more opposite our firing line. The other vessels followed in her wake, each one opening up upon us as she swung into position. Our own fire never diminished, and I doubt if 25% of our shots went wild. It had never been given to me to see such deadly accuracy of aim, and it seemed as though a little figure on one of the craft dropped at the explosion of each bullet. While the banners and upper works dissolved in spurts of flame as the irresistible projectiles of our warriors mowed through them, the fire from the vessels was most ineffectual. Owning, as I afterward learned, to the unexpected suddenness of the first volley, <coughs> which caught the ship's crew entirely unprepared and the sighting apparatus of the guns unprotected from the deadly aim of our warriors. It seems that each green warrior has certain objective points for his fire under relatively identical circumstances of warfare. For example, a proportion of them, always the best marksmen, direct their fire entirely upon the wireless finding and sighting apparatus of the big guns of an attacking naval force. Another detail attends to the smaller guns in the same way. Others pick off the gunners, still others the officers, while certain other quotas concentrate their attention upon the other members of the crew upon the upper works, and upon the steering gear and propellers. Twenty minutes after the first volley of great fleet swung trailing off in the direction from which it had first appeared, several of the craft were limping perceptibly and seemed but barely under the control of their depleted crews. Their fire had ceased entirely and all their energies seemed focused on escape. Our warriors then rushed up to the roofs of the buildings, which we occupied, and followed the retreating armada with a continuous full assade of deadly fire. One by one, however, the ships managed to dip below the crests of the outlying hills until only one barely moving craft was in sight. This had received the brunt of our fire and seemed to be entirely unmanned. 
as not a moving figure was visible upon her decks. Slowly she swung from her course, circling back toward us in an erratic and pitiful manner. Instantly the warriors ceased firing, for it was quite apparent that the vessel was entirely helpless, and far from being in a position to inflict harm upon us, she could not even control herself sufficiently to escape. As she neared the city, the warriors rushed out upon the plain to meet her, but it was evident that she was, still, too high for them to hope to reach her decks. From my vantage point in the window, I could see the bodies of her crew strewn about, although I could not make out what manner of creatures they might be. Not a sign of life was manifest upon her as she drifted slowly with the light breeze in a southeasterly direction. She was drifting some 50 feet above the ground, followed by all but some hundred of the warriors who had been ordered back to the roofs to cover the possibility of a return of the fleet or of reinforcements. It soon became evident that she would strike the face of the buildings about a mile south of our position, and as I watched the progress, the chase I saw a number of warriors gallop ahead, dismount, and enter the building she seemed destined to touch. As the craft neared the building, and just before she struck, the Martian warriors swarmed upon her from the windows, and with their great spears eased the shock of the collision and in a few moments they had thrown out grappling hooks and the big boat was being hauled to ground by their fellows below. After making her fast, they swarmed the sides and searched the vessel from stem to stern. I could see them examining the dead sailors, evidently for signs of life, and presently a party of them appeared from below dragging a little figure among them. The creature was considerably less than half as tall as the green Martian warriors, and from my balcony I could see that it walked erect upon two legs, and surmised that, it, surmised that it was some new and strange Martian monstrosity with which I had not as yet become acquainted. They removed their prisoner to the ground and then commenced a systematic rifling of the vessel. This operation required several hours, during which time a number of the chariots were requisitioned to transport the loot, which consisted in arms, ammunition, silks, furs, jewels, strangely carved stone vessels, and a quantity of solid foods and liquids, including many casks of water. The first I had seen since my advent upon Mars. After the last load had been removed, the warriors made lines fast to the craft and towed her far out into the valley in a southwesterly direction. A few of them then boarded her and were busily engaged in what appeared, from my distant position, as the emptying of the contents of various carboys upon the dead bodies of the sailors and over the decks and works of the vessel. This operation concluded they hastily clambered over her sides, sliding down the guy ropes to the ground. The last warrior to leave the deck turned and threw something back upon the vessel, waiting an instant to note the outcome of his act. As a faint spurt of flame rose from the point where the missile struck, he swung over the side and was quickly upon the ground. Scarcely had a, he alighted, then the guy ropes were simultaneously released, and the great warship, lightened by the removal of the loot, soared majestically into the air, her decks and upper works a mass of roaring flames. Slowly she drifted to the southeast, rising higher and higher as the flames ate away her wooden parts and diminished the weight upon her. Ascending to the roof of the building, I watched her for hours, until finally she was lost in the dim vistas of the distance. The sight was awe-inspiring in the extreme as one contemplated this mighty floating funeral pyre, drifting unguided and unmanned through the lonely wastes of the Martian heavens. A derelict of death, and ferocious creatures into whose unfriendly hands fate had carried it. 
Much depressed and, to me, unaccountably so, I slowly descended to the streets. The scene I had witnessed seemed to mark the defeat and annihilation of the forces of a kindred people rather than the routing by our green warriors of a horde of similar, though unfriendly, creatures. I could not fathom the seeming hallucination, nor could I free myself from it, but somewhere in the innermost recesses of my soul I felt a strange yearning toward these unknown foemen and a mighty hope surged through me that the fleet would return and demand a reckoning from the green warriors who had so ruthlessly and wantonly attacked it. Close at my heel, in his now accustomed place, followed Woola, the hound, and as I emerged upon the street, Sola rushed up to me as though I had been the object of some search on her part. The cavalcade was returning to the plaza, the homeward march having been given up for that day, nor, in fact, was it rec recommenced for more than a week, owing to the fear of a return attack by the aircraft. Lorquas Potmel was too astute an old warrior to be caught open upon the plains with a caravan of chariots and children. And so we remained at the deserted city until the danger seemed past. As Sola and I entered the plaza, a sight met my eyes, which filled my whole being with a great surge of mingled hope, fear, exultation, and depression. And yet most dominant was a subtle sense of relief and happiness. For just as we neared the throng of Martians, I caught a glimpse of the prisoner from the battlecraft who was being roughly dragged into a nearby building by a couple green Martian females. And the sight which met my eyes was that of a slender, girlish figure, similar in every detail to the earthly women of my past life. She did not see me at first, but just as she was disappearing through the portal of the building, which was to be her prison, she turned and her eyes met mine. Her face was oval and beautiful in the extreme. Her every feature was finely chiseled and exquisite. Her eyes large and lustrous and her head surmounted by a mass of coal black waving hair caught loosely in a strange yet becoming coif. Her skin was a light reddish copper color which against the crimson glow of her cheeks and the ruby of her beautifully molded lips shone with a strangely enhancing effect. She was as destitute of clothes as the green Martians who accompanied her. Indeed, save for her highly wrought ornaments, she was entirely naked, nor could any apparel have enhanced the beauty of her perfect and symmetrical figure. As her gaze rested on me, her eyes opened wide in astonishment, and she made a little sign with her free hand, a sign which I did not, of course, understand. Just a moment we gazed upon each other, and then the look of hope and renewed courage, which had glorified her face as she discovered me, faded into one of utter dejection, mingled with loathing and contempt. I realized I had not answered her signal, and ignorant as I was of Martian customs, I intuitively felt that she had made an appeal for succor and protection, which my unfortunate ignorance had prevented me from answering. And then she was dragged out of my sight into the depths of the deserted ed edifice. <laughs>